interesting field the endeavor of the computer science department hello the endeavor of the computer science department is really praiseworthy for organizing this kind of webinars and iqac and all the faculty members of our college are continuously supporting such events i will now invite all to participate in this interesting session i am over to onupam thank you thank you sir for always being a pillar of support in all our endeavor now i would like to request our iqc coordinator dr choitali tobini to kindly deliver welcome address madam over to you good morning everybody welcome to this international webinar organized by department of computer science government general dt college singapore during this period along with other departments of our college the department of computer science is organizing various innovative lectures in the current scenario the word computer has become a part of our very essence they are trying to touch upon the plethora of applications of computer science today is no exception today our speaker is dr rajdeep mukherjee he will be delivering a lecture on formal verification of real world softwares a very hearty welcome to you sir and i want to thank the department of computer science shondipon shomit and onupam for their endeavors thank you all thank you madam for your constant inspiration and motivation now i would like to give a brief introduction about today's eminent speaker dr rajdeep mukherjee at present dr mukherjee is an applied scientist at amazon web services before moving to amazon he worked as a principal software engineer in jasper r&d team at cadence design system he obtained ms from iit kharagpur and phd in computer science from university of oxford his research interests are formal verification programming language program analysis abstracts interpretation sat smst solvers model checking and equivalence check checking now i would like to request dr mukherjee to deliver his speech Uh, hi everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, a great opportunity for me uh, to showcase uh, my research, and uh, I really appreciate the platform uh, that has been provided today. And as the introductory speakers have mentioned uh i think uh, being a computer scientist and being a computer science student uh, some of the folks in the call i guess are also students teachers mixed bag uh, we all we all write softwares and uh, nowhere in the point in history has software become so much important in our lives um we uh eat software we breathe software uh we do softwares with everything if you snatch my mobile phone for half an hour i can't stay uh, if you stop my internet connection it's hard to stay um so with this backdrop i think uh, given the condition in the world we are all fortunate to be part of computer science so that we can all uh, deliver uh and we can deliver in a way such that it is impactful um so one thing which i want to do today is to uh give you a real notion of softwares and how software verification is important and how it saves lives um i am fortunate to be part of uh, various organizations in the past uh from where i learned uh various ways of writing softwares building softwares building world class uh products in software and also in hardware 
and uh, seeing customer satisfaction from that. Uh, so I was a student uh, long back and um, I learned basic computer science algorithms, data structure. But when I moved to industry, I learned a completely different aspect of computer science, which is uh, how to build uh, real world software and how to verify uh, correctness of that software. Because so many lives are dependent on that software. And if there is one key takeaway from this talk today, uh, that will be uh, that formal verification and mathematical pro proving of software correctness is part and parcel of our lives. Uh, so with, the, with that context, I would like to kind of share my screen and start the presentation. So let me check if the sharing works in my machine. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, can you see my screen here? Yes. Uh, so which screen are you looking at? So I, I am currently in a multiple desktop. So are you looking at formal verification of real world softwares in the screen? Yes. Amazing. OK, so let's get started. Um, I'll, I'll expand this presentation. Um, let me do it from here. Slideshow. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the title of the talk is Formal Verification of Real World Softwares. And my name is Rajdeep Mukherjee. I am an applied scientist at Amazon. Uh, so, a brief point of view about me um, uh, this is me, a serious version of me. This is a very funny version of me on the right. Uh, on the extreme left, these are the organizations from where I studied at various points in my life. Uh, I started from University of Calcutta, where I did my uh, undergrad and, uh, uh, and also did my uh, BTEC. Uh, I moved to IIT Kharagpur, where I was first introduced to formal verification uh, and the world of uh, model checking and software and hardware verification. Um, then I uh, moved to University of Oxford in United Kingdom, uh, where I did my PhD uh, on formal verification. Uh, so this is my summary of academic life. On the research front, uh, I was fortunate to work in Microsoft Research, um, which actually is a, a extremely vibrant place for uh, applying verification tools and verification techniques. Uh, because Microsoft Research is a place where there are a lot of softwares being written by software developers, and it's an extremely good place to do research in formal verification. Um, I worked in Cadence for two years, where I um, developed tools uh, in formal verification, which is used predominantly by uh, companies like Apple, Samsung, whoever manufactures mobile phone. And I, I'll explain in the later slides that why formal verification is important for cheap industry, like Apple, Samsung, Intel, ARM, uh, all those industries. Um, I worked in a startup in Deep Blue in the past, and Deep Blue is a startup uh, which is from Oxford University from our same department. Um, and as you can see, it says AI for code, which means that it applies abstract interpretation or uh, no, sorry, not, not abstract interpretation. It applies artificial intelligence for code, which means that uh, it is a smart tool which detects bugs in the code by applying artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. So these are proprietary techniques which are developed by Deep Blue. I will not go into the details of these techniques, but this is an upcoming uh, direction in formal verification and, and Deep Blue is the European startup which is doing pretty well in terms of funding in formal verification space. Uh, I also worked in ARM, uh, which is uh, yeah, like a cheap, uh, a cheap uh, company. Uh, so ARM and Intel are the more the, the biggest cheap players, and in mobile phones, for example, in Samsung, Apple, whatever mobile phones people are using these days. It's all ARM-based uh, CPUs. Um, so ARM has its own specification language, and there is a huge verification challenge which talks about um, how, to, how to verify ARM-based chips. Uh, and then currently I am in Amazon, 
where uh, in particular I'm working at Amazon Web Services uh, where I apply formal verification uh, in Amazon's cloud computing techniques. Um, so as you can see, given all this different context, uh, I have applied formal verification both in hardware industry as well as software industry. So I'll present my talk today from the uh, perspective of what the industry formal verification means. Uh, so what it is all about, formal verification. So we all are computer scientists. We all write lots of lots of softwares. And as I sta stated in the beginning, we eat software, we drink software, we write software. Software is everything. And we write like uh, several thousands lines of code each and every day in order to make the customer lives better. So how do you check that the software you are writing is working correctly? So I, I write software for cloud computing. And uh, this makes uh, Amazon sell products to companies like uh, Netflix or companies like, uh, you know, uh, avionics industry, for example, Boeing, where all these softwares are sold. Um, but who checks the software? Who knows that the software doesn't have bug? Uh, what is the guarantee? Who tests it? Who uses these tools? Uh, so there are army of developers who write those softwares and then there would be uh, professionals like verification specialists who design verification tool and apply the, those tools using mathematical logic to check if the software is indeed doing what it is expected to do. For example, you can't imagine a car sold by Toyota or any other companies without verifying their softwares inside it. Uh, so software is everywhere, uh, but you need also verification techniques which checks uh, that a given software is correct. Uh, now, softwares can be written in multiple languages. There are several languages in which uh, softwares are developed. Uh, it varies from company to company. For example, Google is a, is a kind of company which uses a lot of C++. Um, uh, on the other hand, Amazon is a kind of company which uses a lot of Java and Python. Um, on the other scale, if you look at Facebook, it's a mix of uh, C++ and Java, uh, as well as Rust. So these are the different programming languages. So as a verification expert, one need to be a programming language expert, because until and unless I know the semantics of a programming language, I can't build a verification tool for that language. So formal verification tools what it does is basically it traverses. It, it's a search problem. Given a code in any language, either it's a C++ or Java or Python or JavaScript, it builds a graph of all the executions in that code. And it builds a graph with some properties in it. And then it tries to traverse this graph and tries to search for bugs. Now, one would argue that uh, how are these bugs represented in a program? So oftentimes, uh, people write assertions in the program. And the assertions are basically the way in which you specify that this is what is intended behavior of the software. And this is what the software does. Now, the way the software is written could be buggy, which means that it did not follow some specification in some corner cases. And maybe that's the corner case that uh, matters the most. So using the formal verification tool, one would try to find all such paths and check whether there is a uh, falsification of an assertion or a specification that the software is supposed to obey. Uh, so this is basically, an, in a nutshell, what formal verification is. Uh, now, most of you may wonder that what is the difference between testing and formal verification? So in testing, you would write targeted test cases or directed test cases that would only check part of your software. So if your software has, uh, let's say, n number of variables, then you would have 2 to the power n number of state spaces to traverse. Uh, using testing, you can't ever do write 2 to the power n number of test cases because that's infeasible. Even if you throw the world's uh, highest CPU power and computational power to it, it's not going to solve the problem. So formal verification is the mathematical guarantee in which it develops a model of a software, and then it uses mathematical logic to verify that that model satisfies the specification. So 
I talked about formal verification in industry. So this talk would heavily rely on industrial application of formal verification. So I listed just few companies to name a few on the left, which are the software companies which heavily uses uh, formal verification in their day-to-day -day lives. For example, Facebook has a team uh, which actually applies formal verification in their WhatsApp application because WhatsApp is a very um, uh, useful and popular uh, chat service. Uh, but how do you guarantee that the end-to-end -end encryption that WhatsApp guarantees is not broken or is not buggy? So there are army of people or army of verification uh, engineers in Facebook who tries to apply formal verification tool to check whether there are bugs in the WhatsApp application uh, such that the end-to-end -end encryption that the WhatsApp guarantees is always obeyed and uh, customers' uh, chat or private messages are not leaked out. There, and then there is Microsoft, which applies formal verification in the Microsoft operating system. So Microsoft has a huge team which applies uh, formal verification tools uh, to check the Windows operating system. And uh, it, the Windows operating system has been existing since uh, like 2000s, uh, in the year 2000s. And since then, Microsoft has built this army of formal verification engineers and also developed in-house tools to check the correctness of the Microsoft Windows operating system, as well as the various device drivers. So um, I personally use Mac operating system, but I know folks who use Windows operating system. Uh, in Windows operating system, you'd oftentimes get uh, updates in the device drivers. Uh, now Microsoft has built a verification tool called SLAM, which actually checks bugs in the device drivers because device drivers, if they are not checked to be correct, then they can have uh, a really uh, manifest uh, different types of erroneous behaviors, which is bad for a consumer or a customer. And uh, the third one is Google. So Google is a, a very funny company. It uh, has a lot of formal verification applications in several of its products. Uh, like a lot of folks uses Google Maps and Google Search. Uh, so it uses heavily like formal verification in Google Apps and any Android-based uh, uh, operating system. Uh, so again, like these are the top three companies which uses formal verification in all, almost all of their major products. And then there is Amazon, which uses formal verification for all their web services, cloud computing. Uh, and this cloud computing uh, infrastructure in Amazon is very API specific. So API stands for Application Program Interface. So let's say I have built a product which uh, has an API. Let's say the API name is uh, uh, Foo. So uh, customer use these APIs to access Amazon Web Services for accessing cloud computing, for doing machine learning jobs, uh, for training their model in machine learning, for doing like different types of speech recognition, and uh, natural language processing and so on and so on and so forth. So how does Amazon guarantees that all these APIs that Amazon is building as part of their Java SDK or Python SDK, these are properly used by customers. So uh, Amazon has uh, like several scientists who are working in this domain to just uh, ensure that the APIs that the Amazon developers are developing are actually correct APIs that they guarantee atomicity property, they guarantee mutual exclusiveness properties, uh, concurrency properties. So these are the types of properties that are often checked with a verification tool. And we develop uh, the techniques for doing that inside Amazon. And then there are several other companies I have not named them. Like there would be a list of 500 other companies which uses formal verification in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and then there on the right side, you see a bunch of hardware industries. I'm not going to each and every industry here, but you can imagine from my experience, I have seen uh, like developers open, start their day in the morning with a cup of coffee in their tea, in their, in their, in their uh, desk and start using a formal verification tool to find bugs, right? So Intel cannot ship uh, their CPU without finding bugs. So as a manager of a company, if you see that there are no bugs in the CPU, you will have nightmares because 
like softwares and hardware are not correct so having bugs is always good and our job is to find bugs so uh, if if a manager sees that uh, a cpu doesn't have bug it is really a nightmare so if there are bugs then that's always a good case because then that means that the verification tool is working correctly and finding those bugs uh, and then the developers going and fixing them uh, and then there is apple samsung arm nvidia so they all use uh, formal verification in one form or the other so uh, i would use few terms here uh, there are a uh, different taxonomy of verification uh, what does functional verification means uh, so at the functional level uh, you uh, specify that your software should behave in certain way either you specify with assertions writing assertions in the program or one can specify using various specification languages like uh, linear temporal logic or computational temporal logic so these are logical ways like the propositional logic which we all have studied in our undergrad uh, these are various ways of writing specification language uh, so what one specifies is what one envisions to uh, check using a form functional verification tool and this is the definition of functional verification that what is specified is what one envision to check using the tool and then uh, at the implementation level how is this uh, incorporated so what one designs is what one specifies so for example if the specification is let's say the golden model then the design deviates from the specification that would be a very bad concern because we want the design to be a subset of the specification because imagine uh, someone tells that or oh, write a program that checks all prime numbers now you write a correct program which indeed generates all the prime numbers but you also write one little branch in your program which actually generates a non prime number now although that's one little branch is leading to the bug but it may be a serious bug in a gigantic production software so that's why uh, the software the behavior of the software or the design in this case is a subset of the behavior that the specification language implies so this is at the implementation level and then at the production level there is another uh, notion of production testing or production verification where you do the end to end verification for example starting from the concept to the production of the silicon so i have shown a hardware uh, kind of uh, flow chart here uh, but you can Im imagine the similar thing happening in the software domain where starting from a concept and the concept is very abstract way that okay let's build a whatsapp software now what does that mean there are so many nitty gritties for building a software so that's a concept and then you Uh, formalize that concept as a specification language so here you uh, like introduce a lot of semantics to the language and try to conceptualize the abstract notion into a more formal notion and that's why this is a formal specification which is the golden model based on which a software would be written or a hardware would be written so normally uh, the way it works in the industry is that this specification language is given to the software developers and then the software developers who read this specification either in english or in a for mathematical formal language let's say a uh, propositional logic or a linear temporal logic and then the developer the software developer or the hardware developer would actually design the software or the hardware right so you see that the entire uh, flow chain starts from here that it starts from a concept then a specification is being written and then a product or a software or a hardware is being built from that specification and then for a hardware based flow there would be like transistors because end of the day you want to manufacture your hardware so if you are a samsung or a apple you want to manufacture a phone out of that so there would be verification at this level as well where you verify a transistor level uh, verification and then there would be a silicon level verification which means that you do the end to end verification starting from the software to the hardware and their integration so uh, this is the taxonomy of verification now i will uh, actually jump on to a uh, uh, slide here which talks about uh, formal property verification which is uh, a way of doing model checking 
Uh, now, a model here is a model of a software or a hardware and is typically represented as a finite state machine. Now, in the undergrad level, we all are aware of uh, what a finite state machine is. So it's a, it's a state transition system which has some starting state, some uh, transition uh, function, and some uh, end state. So typically designs uh, are represented as finite state machine. And a specification is basically a temporal logic or any mathematical logic which uh, is used to specify what this finite transition system is supposed to do, right? So let's say we give an example like this, that if a request is received, it will be processed within three clocks. Let's say this is a hardware transition system. And here we have a request and the specification says that if a request is received, then we expect that to be processed within the three clock cycles. And this is, let's say, the transition system on which we will run our uh, property. So given this transition system, if there is a branch in that transition system which do, do not guarantee processing of the request within the three clock cycles, then that means there is a bug in this finite state system. And a verification tool would actually encode this specification in a mathematical logic and then it would encode this transient system into a into another symbolic formula and i'll show you how that encoding is being done and then it will use a sat solver or a satisfiability solver so we all know what the np complete problem is right so satisfiability solver is a classical np complete problem so given a propositional logic we want to test whether this propositional formula has a satisfying assignment or not. So this is a classical NP-complete problem. And we use a lot of satisfiability solvers and satisfiability modulo theory, SMT solvers, in order to solve the formulas that are generated from this transition system and this specification here. So uh, in a nutshell, this is all about formal property verification. The reason we say property is because this English sentence here is actually modeled in a uh, mathematical logic, which is the property for that design. And uh, I exp already explained what formal verification means. And model checking is just uh, one technique of doing formal property verification. There are other bunch of techniques for doing formal property verification. Uh, but today, uh, just within one hour, I won't be able to complete uh, all the different aspects. So I'll focus on uh, mostly the, um, the, the, the model checking aspect. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, so here, um, I'll explain basically uh, what it means to uh, test with simulation versus formal verification. Uh, now, I talked about testing, right? So testing is much more directed, where you write test cases and then you do simulation. So the coverage of the testing is always as good as the test cases, right? So you are never guaranteed to uh, write exhaustively the set of all test cases that a program should have. So that's why, uh, as you can see on the left side, um, the test cases are these blue dots here. and uh, these are the test cases which are covering this part of the design. So if you consider this whole circle, uh, this Venn diagram as a kind of the entire state space of the design, then these blue dots represent the test cases that are actually tested for this particular design. And the red dot is where the bug or the error lies, right? So imagine you wrote a software and uh, the error is this uh, red dot in that software. But the test cases that you have written are these blue dots. So you one would faultly say that, oh, my software is correct. But no, your software is not correct. It has a bug. And the reason it has a bug is because your test cases were not exhaustive to capture that bug, right? So, and for a human, it is impossible to write that many number of test cases because softwares are millions and billions lines of code. Now, how do you ensure that uh, you have so many test cases to exhaustively test that your software doesn't skip any bug, right? So this is a classical uh, like diagram which shows that simulation is not exhaustively complete. But what formal verification guarantees is that this mathematical proof, right? So it is not test case driven, 
it is basically trying to solve the same puzzle by building a symbolic formula from a design and a symbolic formula of the specification and then using a satisfiability solver in the back end to reason about that design. So in that aspect, it's much more exhaustive and it's much more guaranteeing that if the verification tool runs on the software and it comes back and says, I haven't found any bug, then that means that indeed the software is correct, which the testing cannot guarantee, right? But if the verification tool runs on the software and it comes back and says, I got a bug, then that bug is actually a true bug, right? So these are the guarantees which are provided by a formal verification tool and hence the application of that tool becomes very relevant in an industrial context. So switching to the next slide, um, I talked about that uh, a classical formal verification. So now I'll focus mostly on model checking, which is a technique of formal verification. Uh, so this is a classically a search problem, right? So all we are trying to do is to search for a error state or a buggy state in the program. Uh, now, the way this is done is by, you can imagine that it's trying to search for error state by expanding this circle from inwards to outwards. So uh, the way this works is that, uh, this search algorithm works is that uh, we start from the initial state of the transition system. We apply one step, uh, one next step function. We apply the second next step function. We apply the third next step function and so on. Now, there could be bounded uh, number of loops in the program. So oftentimes when we write software, we use loops, right? In C, we write for loop, while loop. Uh, in, in, in other languages, we have different constructs for loop, but we all use loops to do iterations on something, right? So if you want to fetch uh, a set of key and value pairs from a map data structure uh, in standard library, then you have to write a loop to fetch those key and value pairs, right? So loops and part and parcel of our life. So, uh, and loops can be bounded, loops can be unbounded. Uh, for unbounded loops, they often lead to infinite execution. Uh, in that case, formal verification tools ap uh, actually use over approximation. And the over approximation is basically you start from this little yellow uh, dot here, and then you keep on expand expanding, 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 and until and unless you exhaustively apply and you get no farther new states. So that is the notion of over approximation. So at that point you stop. So uh, we can have bounded loops, we can have unbounded loops and unbounded loops often lead to infinite uh, execution trace. Uh, in this context, I'll only talk about uh, uh, model checking techniques that are applied in a bounded loop context. For example, the loops in the program is basically uh, saying that uh, i for a variable i, i is less than or equal to some variable n, where n is also a bounded integer, right? So, and in those cases, we can exhaustively uh, unwind all the loop iterations and can generate a gigantic symbolic formula from that software and then feed that symbolic formula to a satisfiability solver to solve them. But essentially, you can see the bigger picture here, right? That we are trying to uh, unwind the loops in the program and generate a, such a formula. So um, without further ado, I think it's a good time to uh, move to uh, 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 a tool-based demonstration. And I have picked this tool called CBMC. So this is a tool from Oxford. Uh, it's very widely used in uh, industrial softwares. For example, Facebook uses this tool. Google uses this tool, Amazon uses this tool, uh, and this is a bounded model checker for just C programs, right? So in undergrad uh, uh, or in postgrad, we all write C programs. Now, how do you formally check that your C program is correct? Um, oftentimes, we write test cases, but as I mentioned earlier, test cases are not exhaustive. So CBMC is a C-based bounded model checking tool developed in Oxford to uh, perform formal verification on softwares which are written in C programming language. So let me jump on to the uh, CBMC uh, slides and I'll, I'll share my screen um, 
for CBMC demonstration. So let me see. Um, is my screen still visible to everyone? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, oops, sorry. Yeah. So, um, and this is going to be a like you know very informal kind of uh, uh, background of CBMC. I mean, CBMC is a huge tool, and I would uh, really encourage all the uh, audiences here that uh, you should uh, like after this talk, if you're interested, uh, check out uh, the CBMC tool. Uh, download it from the from the uh, our Oxford group and run it on any C program you have uh, with some specification and this specification can be provided as an assertion. So um, what the CBMC tool does is uh, very useful in a practical settings. Uh, so let's look at the way the tool works. So this is kind of a, like you know a slide which has like you know two two uh, pages in one single window. So I hope this is not a, a, a deviation, uh, but I'll, I'll try to explain it uh, one at a time. So uh, we'll first explain the, I'll first, first explain the left side of this slide and then I'll explain the right side. Um, so let's look at the preliminaries. So um, uh, as I mentioned, CBMC is a tool that analyzes for bugs in programs which are commonly written in C. Uh, it has limited support for C++, and it has a brand new tool for Java, which is called JBMC. So again, BMC stands for Bounded Model Checking, and I just uh, defined the term bounded, which means that all the loops in the program are bounded. Um, so how does this tool work? So as a first step, what uh, essentially is happening here is that given a program in C, C++, there is a parser for that program. And then the parse tree is generated. We all know we have studied compiler in our undergrad life. We know what a parse tree is. Now, given this parse tree, there is a control flow graph that is generated. Now, control flow graph is uh, essential uh, intermediate representation, which is called IR, in any programming language. For example, uh, if, if you use LLVM, which is um, another parser, uh, it has its own intermediate language. Uh, CBMC, uh, the intermediate language for CBMC is called uh, go-to programs because essentially CBMC translates uh, every software which are written in C, C++ into 18 different instructions. And these are called go-to programs. And this go-to program is nothing but a controlled data flow graph. So it's a graph structure which has the nodes in it and the control and data flow edges in it. And uh, essentially, this graph structure has uh, only 18 different instructions. So that's why it's called a go-to program, which is the intermediate language for the tool CVMC. Uh, now let's look at the right side. So there is an example here, which basically uh, is very simple. So it, it has a if statement. And inside this if, we have a, a conjunction. And this conjunction is basically saying that this variable t is greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to uh, 79. So let's say this is an arbitrary uh, condition defined in your software. And then there is a switch case statement which basically checks if t is uh, divided by 20, uh, then there can be four cases, case 0, case 1, uh, case 2, and case 3. So we all are familiar with uh, writing switch case statements in a program. Uh, and depending on uh, this switch case statement, either it goes to 0, 1, 2, 3, or it goes to the default value, which actually asserts that 0, which means that it will fail, it will fail every time, right, if, if, if it reaches this assert 0. So if you write a simple C program which basically has void main and then assert 0, it's always going to fail, right? So uh, we, all we want to test here is that um, uh, given this program, if it is ever possible to reach this assertion, Right now, how will this program be represented as a, as a control flow graph? Now, you can imagine that if this if is satisfied, which means that this branch is taken, then this condition has to satisfy, which is basically zero less than equal to t less than equal to seventy nine. 
And then once this is satisfied, since the switch is nested inside this if statement, uh, there will be these different cases, case zero, case one, case two, case three, and then the default case. Now, each of these cases has a, 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 has a like body, right? And then a break statement. Now, uh, if this case zero is satisfied, it goes to its body, which is the, the, the branched out from the case zero. If the case zero is not satisfied, then T divided by 20 is not equal to zero because the switch case is uh, based on T divided by 20 expression. So if case zero is not satisfied, then this age here must satisfy T divided by 20, not is equal to zero. Similarly, you can see wh where this is all going, right? So in case one, if this is satisfied, then it will enter this branch. Else, if it's not satisfied, then T divided by 20 is not is equal to one, right? And same for case two and case three. So this is the control flow graph for this particular branch statement with switch case nested inside it. And then there is a default case and all of this actually meets, uh, like in, in the normal uh, go to program, it is called a phi node. And this phi node is basically the accumulation of all the if else branches into a single node. So this is how the intermediate representation would look like. Now, how would we do a formal verification on this control flow graph, right? So that's the question we are trying to solve here. So um, uh, let's say uh, I, I mentioned about like uh, uh, bounded model checking. You can call it bounded program analysis, whatever. Uh, the goal here is to check properties of the form AGP, and this is basically an assertion. So what this AGP is, is that it checks that for all paths in the program, globally, my property P should be true, right? So this is a way of specifying a temporal logic. And this is the specification language, which is a mathematical way of specifying that what your software is supposed to do. Now, A stands for for all paths, right? So we are saying for all paths in this program, G stands for globally, which means that universally, it's P, which is the property, should always be true. So one could also write this assertion or property as E F P. I haven't shown it here for simplicity, but you can imagine this. If we write a property like E F P instead of A G P, it would mean that E stands for existential, so there exists at least one path in this program. A would stand for eventually, which means that there exists at least one path which eventually leads to P being true, right? So you get the point here that you one would use a different uh, a syntactic sugar for specifying the programming language to specify uh, the assertions. Uh, and that is the specification language for, for any given program. And then the idea here is that it follows paths through the control flow graph to the assertion and builds a formula corresponding to that path. Now let's look uh, at a concrete example here. So let's revisit this example again, uh, where you see on the left, the uh, ages are now highlighted with red marks here, right? So this red mark actually indicates that I am interested in this path in the program, right? So let's say my value of T is between zero and uh, 79. And then I have a switch statement. And then let's say the value of T is such that that T less than T divided by 20 is actually not satisfied, but T divided by 20 is equal to one is satisfied. So I did not enter case zero, but I entered case one, right? And then I exited from this if. Now, how would that be modeled as a path formula in the program, in the actual uh, verification tool? So this is the formula that will be generated inside a verification tool by traversing this particular path, right? So what are the different, so this is a like conjunction, right? So what are the different conjunctions for this particular path? So it says that T is between zero and 79 and T is, T divided by 20 is not is equal to zero 
and t divided by 20 is equal to 1 because it's taking the case 1 here, which is true case. And then what are these statements? These are basically the statements in this case 1, which is this TEM2 and TEM3 assignment. So that's why this TEM2 and TEM3 assignments are, are here, right? So um, this is the specification uh, or, or this is the symbolic formula that is generated by encoding one path in this program. Now for completeness, the verification tool would encode all the paths in this program. So it's going to be a disjunction of these conjunctions, right? So, and that's why this is called a conjunctive normal form formula. So this is one path. There will be another path which goes through the K0 branch and that will have its own formula. And then there will be a disjunction of all these conjunctive formulas. So once these formulas are constructed, what is essentially done is that a SAT solver or a satisfiability solver is called. Now I wouldn't go into the details of a SAT solver. My, I mean, my uh, PhD was on developing a SAT solver uh, but uh, I, I assume that you all will be interested and some of you may already know what a SAT solver is and what a SAT solver does. But uh, I would highly encourage like studying the literature of SAT solver because it's a fascinating world for computer scientists, uh, for folks who are interested in search problems, computationally challenging problems. Uh, you can see that SAT solver started from like th uh, solving SAT formulas or propositional formulas with thousands of variables in the early 2000. But now in 2020, SAT solvers or satisfiability solvers, which are commercial solvers, can solve a propositional formula with millions of variables, right? And you can imagine this kind of scalability was needed for the industry because the industry heavily relies on the SAT solver. So, uh, the scalability of the SAT solver was an uh, important milestone for the software industry uh, to scale their verification tools to verify such complex softwares like WhatsApp, like Android, and like a Windows operating system, which is written in millions of, of lines of code. So uh, the core of any verification tool or, or, or the core of any model checking tool is a SAT solver. So that's the king. That's the kind of the, the, the brain of any verification tool, you may call it. So um, what essentially is happening here is that this formula is being thrown to a SAS solver now, right? So decision procedure is another name uh, for SAT solvers. Uh, so this formula is given to a decision procedure and then it obtains a satisfying assignment, right? So what is the satisfying assignment? It says that for T is equal to 21, this satisfies this formula, right? So it so whenever this SAT, uh, this formula is thrown to a SAT solver, it actually shows the satisfying assignments, which are this. So um, uh, so the satisfying assignment here is T is twenty one, B is zero, C is zero, D is zero, uh, K two is ten, TEM two is zero, and TEM three is ten. So it came back with a satisfying assignment for this particular branch. Right, so this shows the values for of any inputs on that particular path. Uh, were there any questions? Okay, I take that as no. Um, yeah, so let me proceed. Uh, so, uh, how to determine that which satisfiability solvers are good? Right, so. Um, for folks who would be interested, uh, I would encourage downloading the CBMC tool. And then CBMC has a lot of satisfiability solvers inside it. For example, it uses a very well-known satisfiability solver from Microsoft, which is called Z3. Um, and Z3 is a very powerful solver, which is used day, day in, day out for verifying uh, Windows operating system and the device drivers that goes to your laptops and Windows systems or your Windows phones, right? So you never realize that how much uh, formal verification is used to uh, like to to check the correctness of those device drivers or Windows operating system whenever Windows or Microsoft comes up with a new operating system. So Z3 is their uh, kind of like a state-of-the-art uh, satisfiability solver inside Microsoft 
uh, and I was fortunate to know the core developer of Z3 because he also uh, was from Oxford. He he's now in Cambridge, who actively develops this Microsoft uh, Z3 version, um, and he's a terrific guy. So he actually makes sure that all the Windows operating system are actually uh, validated with their uh, Z3 SAT solver. Now there are other industrial SAT solvers like EICs, which is developed by SRI in Stanford in the US. Um, which also is very powerful and also used in various industries like Apple and Intel. Uh, and then there are academic versions of SAT, uh, SAT solvers, which are uh, Bullector or um, CVC4, which is developed also in Stanford. Uh, and, 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 the, and, and they have actually a competition all the year, like once in a year, where all the SAT solvers or SMT solvers from various universities in India and outside in the world participates and try to build the uh, or, or try to crack the most challenging problem for that year. So they have prize money for that as well. So every year they declare a champion SAT solver or champion SMT solver. And this is a perfect opportunity for any graduate student uh, to kind of indulge in developing their own satisfiability solver so that they can participate in these competitions. So just a note for all graduates out there that if you're interested in this kind of competition, just Google SAT solver competition. And then you would have like the most recent state of the art SAT solvers and all the competition results from this year. And also you can participate by building your own solver. Um, so essentially all these solvers have a uh, target few things, right? Because program, programming language is a complex thing. Um, so the solvers target specific logic, right? And this logic can be a bit vector logic, uh, which includes nonlinear arithmetics. For example, we have uh, all solved uh, linear programming problems in our undergrads, right? Uh, so uh, some of these solvers actually implement a linear programming uh, solver inside them, right? Uh, to to solve linear arith uh, nonlinear arithmetics and linear arithmetic formulas. Uh, and, and then there would be arrays. So these arrays are very popular program constructs in C, C++. Uh, so you need special theory solvers to solve uh, uh, constructs like arrays or lists or maps, uh, like whichever data structure is available in the standard template libraries in all the different object-oriented programming languages. They have their own dedicated uh, solver theory for them. And uh, inside all these solvers, they, these solvers are also written in millions of lines of code, right? And these solvers are used inside a verification tool to solve formulas like this, right? So whenever it sees a formula like this, it says, oh, this is actually a linear arithmetic. This has a bunch of like uh, integer variables. And uh, then it just invokes the theory of integers uh, to solve this particular formula. But if you had replaced this formula with, uh, with a much more complex formula, which had uh, let's say arrays or uh, list or maps, then it would have invoked that particular theory to solve that problem. Now, I was telling you about uh, uh, like the SAT technology, the way it evolved in the past uh, 10 years or a decade. Uh, as you can see in 1960s, it used to solve like on only 100 variables. So for example, you would uh, give uh, a SAT solver a propositional logic formula with 100 variables and then uh, it would die, right? Uh, it would not be able to solve that uh, like beyond 100 variables. And now you can see it solves for almost 1 million variables, right? So in 2010, and now like this is the graph up to 2010, but beyond that period, it now is really scalable. And um, the algorithm, because it's a classic NP complete problem, right? So uh, it always has its scalability limitations, but over time, the engineering aspect of a SAT solver has dramatically improved by like just by throwing bigger boxes, bigger CPU power, uh, bigger machines to it. And also the scientist in this domain constantly refines or iterates the SAT solving algorithm. Uh, so I have developed a SAT solver in my PhD. I know how, how difficult it is to develop a SAT solver. Uh, it's First, it's extremely challenging to build such a gigantic software. And the second, you are trying to solve a computational challenging problem. And you have to use a lot of heuristic, a lot of domain knowledge. For example, some SAT solver would work very well for, let's say, a finite transition system, which has specific properties. Some SAT solver would not scale for that. 
So uh, there are target specific SAT solvers and um, and it, it, it's, it works. I mean, it, it, like companies uses, industry uh, uses this solver in their day-to-day -day life and they're happy about it. So uh, just wanted to like briefly demonstrate that uh, in the past one decade, how much uh, the satisfiability solvers have improved and this scalability improvements in recent years uh, was mainly attributed for the word level reasoning and the various uh, decision procedures for various theories that are now supported inside uh, commercial SAT solvers. Uh, so let's look at another path. So uh, for this same program, so let's say all the branches are not satisfied uh, then we have a program, we have a symbolic formula like this, right? So all these rate branches are not satisfied. So none of these are taken, right? So uh, if you build such a symbolic formula from, from this rate path here and throw to the SAT solver, it comes back and says this is unsat, right? Which means that it did not find any satisfying assignment of this particular formula. Right, because the SAT solver can just give two results. Either it would come back and say, I have found a satisfying assignment, which was in this case, we indeed found a satisfying assignment. Another case where it did not find a satisfying assignment, in which case it would just say unsat, right? Which means that the assertion in that program was unreachable, right? And that's why the program was safe. Now in verification domain, um, you can write an assertion in a way that if it reaches the assertion by solving this satisfying uh, uh, symbolic formula using a SAT solver, then it oftentimes implies that it, your program is doing something wrong because it's violating that particular assertion. But let's say that particular bad state in the program is never reachable. So for example, here, assert zero was a bad state, right? We do not want to reach this state. So we wanted to check if that bad state is reachable or not, right? Because that's a buggy state. Uh, so the SAT solver comes back and says that, no, I, I have an unsat uh, formula for this, so it's not reachable. So which means that the program is safe. Program doesn't have a bug in it, right? So uh, that's the beauty of the SAT solver that it actually says that if your buggy part of the program is reachable or if it's unreachable. Um, and uh, basically, it, uh, like there's a whole world of algorithm uh, that are followed inside a SAT solver. I'm not going into details of that today. Um, but essentially, um, there are like programs like this uh, where uh, typically a variable is assigned and then a variable is incremented inside a condition. Uh, and, and, and the way to generate a symbolic formula from them is by annotating this variable with different timestamps, right? So you see x1 is zero, and then uh, x1 is x0, uh, sorry, this will this is wrong. So this will be x0 is zero, and then y0 is greater than or equal to zero, and then x1 is equal to x0 plus one. So this is actually called a static single assignment form. So each of these formulas are called static single assignment. And then uh, you take a conjunction of all these formulas and then generate one gigantic symbolic formula from the program. Uh, uh, there are several other things, like for example, how pointers are handled. We all are aware of uh, writing pointers in program. Uh, and, and typically in C, you would use malloc-like functions. Uh, now, if you're interested in seeing that how the pointers are modeled as a symbolic formula, this is one way of modeling it. Uh, there's a whole bunch of research that goes inside it, like how to model this may point to analysis, because a pointer can change uh, like uh, like typically the value that it is pointing to can change, right? So it's a, it's a physical address in the memory which actually points to like whatever the value is, right? So how do you model that uh, may point to analysis in the symbolic formula such that uh, the SAT solver is actually able to interpret it in a correct way? So there are challenges of encoding uh, things like malloc and complex things like, you know, loops which are demonstrated on the right side that um, uh, like if you have a loop in the program, you would oftentimes do uh, unrolling of the loop. And this unrolling is basically determines that how many times the loop has to be uh, unwinded in order to generate a formula for the, from there. So this is typically called bounded model checking because that's where the bounded factor comes into play. Um, so uh, these slides are free. I mean, I, I can forward that to Shandipan after this talk and he can distribute it uh, for folks who are interested. 
um but i guess uh, due to uh, kind of um, almost close to the time and in the us it's 10 10:25 in california time so i'm assuming it's almost uh, 5 minutes to 11 in indian time so for the best interest of time i think uh, i'll i'll skip the remaining of the slides but i think uh, uh, f- like folks in the call have got uh, a, a decent overview of what a formal verification is it's not theory it's it's all practical it's used in uh, like everyday lives uh, for many people uh, and i i'd just like to um, uh, like end with one key take away from this talk uh that uh without doing formal verification of software and hardware uh none of the car companies uh can sell cars for example toyota has a huge army of formal verification engineers uh who, who does formal verification of the of the softwares inside toyota and, and the cars today for example tesla which is an electric car in the us uh they employ heavily uh, softwares inside their cars right everything is happening via a software the entire infotainment system in your car is supporting android and ios and imagine the complexity of the software for that the temperature control inside the car and all these things are software controlled these days so none of these car companies can sell car without uh, uh, without doing formal verification and i was lucky to engage in uh, with toyota especially during my phd where i saw how much they use formal verification before a car is sold and then there is the airline industry which actually cannot sell air, aeroplanes without doing formal verification because we all uh, take flights but we take that into granted that uh, the flight is running well but once the pilot takes off uh, i think uh, the rest of the journey the pilot just is hands free because everything is controlled by software once once the flight takes off right uh, so uh, we work with boeing boeing is a industry which actually develops this aeroplanes uh, so there are like lot of complex software problems in boeing in uh, airbus which is a french company which develops aeroplanes uh, and and they they typically use formal verification tools to ensure that the uh simulation software or or the controller software in their aeroplanes are actually working correctly and imagine the millions of lines of code used to write those controller software in an aeroplane and uh, formal verification is part and parcel of boeing and airbus kind of companies who sell aeroplanes and then i talked about cheap industries such as apple samsung who manufacture phones and none of these phones would have been manufactured without without doing a uh, formal verification and same story goes for facebook google and amazon so i hope i'm able to convey the message that this is a very practical field um and it's a very evolving field there are a lot of machine learning applications happening in this field for uh, verifying softwares uh, everyone wants to be software engineers but very few people wants to actually check correctness of software which i to my mind is uh, is the most important aspect of software i mean i'm not biased towards it because i have done phd uh, i mean i i don't know anything better than that and otherwise i'll be jobless uh, but i can strictly say you that given my experiences in hardware and software industry this is the need of the hour we want more graduate students participating in uh, writing softwares i i don't want to convey the message that everyone needs to have verification uh, expertise but i'll convey the message that write software if you are a computer scientist and if you are listening to this talk don't go to sleep don't go to bed without writing 100 lines of code each and every day and that is the mantra that is the kind of like uh, attitude one should have because as a computer science student and as a computer science faculty as a computer scientist if we are not writing software we are not advancing the field so that's my message and i'll conclude with that thank you thank you dr mukherjee uh, it was very enlightening uh, introductory talk on formal verification <clears throat> and uh, the different aspects how the real world is uh, moving with this uh, formal methods and verification in the hardware as well as in the software industry and uh, all of them are heavily depend on uh, these techniques uh, and uh, it was very very uh, wonderful lecture 
and uh, moving on to the question and answer session uh, we have some questions uh, uh, there are a few questions from orpita bhattacharya uh, her question is uh, it is like uh, writing a grammar uh, and then uh, is it possible that we can write some platform uh, which can operate on any language um that's a great question i i i i'll try to answer that um and uh, uh because there are some abstract notions in in the question but um in general writing the platform it would imply that writing a verification tool um and this verification tool in turn would have a parser inside it which would parse the source language and uh, then it would build the control flow graph and then it would build those symbolic formulas which i was showing you from that control flow graph and then it would pass that to the sar solver so these are the various stages uh, of uh, operating or or developing this platform if if you meant a platform to be a verification tool i hope i answered that correctly but i i'm happy to follow up on that question and also she asked uh, in case where we do not know the outcome before that is uh, for in case of unsupervised in such scenario how uh, the sat solver reacts um uh, so i mean sat sol sol solver never knows the outcome right i mean it just takes a random uh, propositional formula which is thrown at it and it tries to uh, solve that formula uh the question on scalability is very much there uh because uh, we have seen like uh folks in apple and intel they wait for almost half a month to one month uh, just to verify one live log situation or a date log situation in their software or their hardware and they are willing to like you know pour in lots of millions of dollars uh to buy verification tools uh to even wait for a month in order to for the verification tool to terminate and provide an answer so we have seen cases where verification tool runs for months and then the sat solver is able to eventually give an answer that yes this is a satisfying assignment or no there is no bugs in the program so yes to uh, answer that question i think uh, the the scalability is the real issue but for practical verification purposes industries are willing to run these tools for months in order to get to a termination point thank you uh, next question uh, is from rudrajit roy uh, he asked if a module in a design is formally verified to be working properly do we need coverage data for that module uh, yeah that's a great question so um uh, the uh, when we say that uh, the module has been verified correctly it depends on what your assertion language is so if your assertion is specifying that uh it it is exhaustively covering all the state space of your program and then if it is satisfied it is definitely going to say that yes in the entire state space state space of the program has been formally verified but if your assertion only checks for a particular case then the verification is as good as the assertion that specified so to answer that question let's say you have a a software which has a init module and a processing block and a networking block and then a dispatcher block and then a communication protocol and then you are writing software only let's say for three of these sub modules so of course the formal verification is not going to guarantee for the remaining sub modules which has no assertions in it so verification guarantees or the coverage of verification depends on how many assertions and what are the coverage of those assertions so if the assertions are covering 100% of the state space then the verification guarantees are exhaustively uh, for that 100% of the state spaces okay uh, thank you uh, next question from him also is uh, what are the advantages of formal verification over dynamic verification um so dynamic verification is a uh, field by itself and there are different flavors of uh, doing uh, dynamic verification so in dynamic verification is a mix of writing assertion along with writing test cases right so uh, if you do a combination and i have seen industries doing combination of both because at some point your satisfiability solver will will run out of steam and then you have to write test cases right so 
uh, dynamic verification is, is is kind of a chosen technique where you know for sure that let's say you have three modules and the third module is the less critical module where you know that if i don't do formal verification on that part of the design then it still should be okay i mean the bugs there is not as critical you do write test cases for them using the dynamic verification technique but for the remaining modules which are critical in the critical path you do apply formal verification so i would say like you know it's it's kind of the practice what the industry follows and dynamic verification is also a very potential alternative techniques i wouldn't say alternative but a complementary technique okay uh, next question is uh, what are the limitations of formal verification oh there are a lot <laughs> so uh, um uh, to start with, I think uh, I think uh, like uh, satisfiability solvers, right? I mean, as I've shown the curve, like in 1960s, we were solving 100 variables because again, end of the day, it's a it's a NP complete problem, right? Uh, in uh, to, 2020, we in Amazon, we are solving like uh, 200,000, like uh, two million variables almost. So of course, the scale has gone like extremely high. Uh, and, and it's able to solve uh, formulas generated from millions of lines of code. But still, I would say like we have a long way to go uh, and, and machine learning comes into picture uh, at this point because uh, if we can scale satisfiability solvers with machine learning, which actually uh, can be trained to solve a particular kind of formulas just by looking at the characteristics of the formula, uh, then uh, probably we'll be better positioned to address the scalability issues. But I would say like formal verification is a niche domain, uh, which is extremely powerful, but it has its own limitations in terms of the scalability. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from myself, Shondipan. Uh, is there any difference between uh, algorithm proof of correctness, proof of correctness of algorithm and the formal verification of software? Yeah, that's a great question, Sandeepan. I think uh, I think the proof of correctness is exactly what a formal verification tool does. Because end of the day, uh, if you get a formal proof for the software, for example, the uh, remember the case I have shown you that where you were uh, passing that symbolic formula to the SAT solver, and the SAT solver comes back and says, "Hey, I, this is unsatisfiable," which means that inside the solver, the solver has done a mathematical proof. Now, all we need to do is to just spit out that proof to the to a kind of like a text file or 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 some uh, like you know uh, JSON configurations, and there are extensive uh, researches which actually shows that the proof that is done by a SAT solver these are nothing but various lemmas and theorems that it is trying to solve. So, um, end of the day, I would say that. Uh, if you take a Fibonacci, Fibonacci series and try to prove that your Fibonacci series program is indeed doing Fibonacci series computation, then uh, you can expect the same uh, proof to be generated by a SAT solver. And you can compare this to proof which are written by human and which are written by a SAT solver internally when it tries to solve that formula, and you would get a commonality between them. So. Yeah, essentially, it's trying to solve lemmas and theorems inside it, inside the solver itself, which is very similar to a way a human or a manual proof would look like. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Rajdi Mukherjee. Uh, so uh, uh, we have done with our question answer session, uh, and the feedback link is given in the chat box. I would request the participants to fill the feedback form uh, and you will receive the e-certificates within three days. And uh, that's all from here. Uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Razdi Mukherjee for your valuable time and this uh, enlightening lecture. Uh, I hope uh, you would be available uh, in the future uh, for more uh, interesting talks. Yeah, I would love to. Like. Uh... This is my first time I'm doing something from the US uh, to India with so many people on the on the bridge. Uh, but yeah, this has been a fascinating experience. I think uh, I can go on for another two hours on a Friday night at 12 uh, midnight. But yeah, I think I think this is amazing. I, I really like this and uh, always open to talk to students and uh, upcoming talents. Uh, I'm pretty sure like there are a lot of uh, very bright and talented people in this call. 
uh but feel free to like you know uh like contact me over email or kind of uh, uh yeah to stay in touch uh would be happy to follow up with any any questions that you may have but yeah uh the mantra is write code write software break things break things fast uh and and don't sleep don't be satisfied with what you are doing because there's so much things to learn there are so much uh, satisfiable problems <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you all the participants uh, for your uh, participation. Uh, again, I am requesting all to fill the feedback form uh, as early as possible. Okay. I am sure you have enjoyed the session, and uh, obviously this is a something new topic uh, you would not have probably uh, go through in your undergraduate or postgraduate. uh so this is an uh, one of the new branches probably one of the new branches uh, uh as far as the students are concerned so kindly go through the uh, lecture uh, we will provide it in our youtube channel and also uh, the also also google it uh, about the this topic and you will know more about it thank you thank you all uh, now we are ending the session thank you thanks everyone take care bye